Okay, this is, as Benny said, this is a little bit of a unique uh, service that we've uh, put together for uh, tonight to try to focus our attention and to engage all of us in somewhat of a personal Holy Week journey uh, so that we could go through and embrace and soak up all that the Lord would have to uh, deliver to us through Holy Week. Uh, I will confess, I love Holy Week. I absolutely get excited about, look forward to, plan uh, my, my year almost around uh, Holy Week. I just love the study uh, of Holy Week. And there's a couple of things the Lord's done uh, in my life to make me love Holy Week. I think that's His idea, not mine, uh, but to make me love the idea of Holy Week. One's pretty predictable, uh, does not surprise me at all, probably should, wouldn't surprise you. The other is somewhat unique. The predictable one is going to Israel with Harry. Uh, going to Israel with Harry changed Holy Week for me forever. Uh, one, it just gave context to be able to actually see and to understand and to, to put yourself uh, in that place. And if you can't go to Holy, if you can't go to Israel with Jesus, then go with Harry. Well, can't go to Israel with uh, Jesus or Harry now, so I don't know who the third person is to go with, but go to Israel, okay? Uh, because one of the things it does is it just uh, helps you to, to allow the setting to kind of materialize so that you actually see and you know and you understand. And if I would say this, if you've never been to Israel, whatever you're thinking, it's one-tenth the size of what you're thinking. So when, when it refers to something, it's right there. So you don't, you don't have to walk and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk to get there. You can point to it. It's right there. So that significantly impacted just my personal study of Holy Week, but the Holy Week, but the other event was somewhat unpredictable. Years ago, I'm going to guess 25 years ago, maybe longer. I can't remember, uh, but years ago, I had the opportunity to play golf with a group of men, and a uh, it was a PGA a Senior Tour chaplain uh, kind of a deal, and it would take place after they would play the Senior PGA Tour here in Birmingham. On that Monday, there was an event, and these se different senior PGA Tour guys would play with uh, four other uh, men, uh, uh, guys like myself, uh, and it was an outreach event. It was a part of their chaplaincy program, and so you would get to play with a senior PGA Tour guy, and then uh, we'd have a, a meal together, and one of them would share their testimony. The gospel would be shared. It was a wonderful, uh, wonderful event, and I got to play with a guy. I'd heard his name. I'd followed him just a little bit, just knew enough to know who he was. His name was Kermit Zarley. Now, he played for years and years on the, on, on the PGA Tour, and so we were playing out at Bentbrook, and we got to about the third or fourth hole, and I was letting the other men brag about how good a golfer they were. Never brag about your golf game to a tour pro, okay? Just don't do it, all right? So, and they were asking for hints and tips and everything like that, and so I just kind of let them have their day, and so I just started into a conversation. He asked me uh, what I did, and I told him, and so he said, I've got a book for you. And I said, great. Uh, he opened up his golf bag. Now, they have enormous golf bags, okay? But he opened up his golf bag, and he reached in, and he pulled out this book. And this book is The Gospels Interwoven by Kermit Zarley. It's, it's a book of the harmony of the Gospels. And so, in other words, uh, the many people have done this. It's not a book like you write a novel, or it's not writing his opinion about something. It's simply trying to harmonize the Gospels. In other words, from a chronological standpoint, how do you take all the Gospels and force them together and figure out in what order did all the events take place? It's a harmonization, or a, as he puts it, interwoven, working them together. Now, he didn't independently do all the work. He pulled from I think it was 13 or 23 different studies over 400 years where people have done this. This has been being done since the Bible was written, okay? So people have tried to put the Gospels together to get a chronological uh, understanding, a timeline of uh, the, the steps of Jesus and what takes place uh, in all of the Gospels. Well, the single most, the, the, uh, the primary benefit that this has had in my life is Holy Week. To be able to take then and put together chronologically uh, what actually took place on that Sunday, what took place on that Monday, what was taught on that Tuesday. And when you study some of these things, you look and go, oh, it makes a difference that he said that parable 48 hours before he was crucified. Oh, it makes a difference that he's in the context of them waiting to arrest him 
when he teaches that particular parable, and all of a sudden it gives you a, a, an insight to it. As Benny mentioned, we've put online uh, the a download of that that's just the Holy Week portion of the Gospels interwoven. Uh, we've put that online uh, for you if you'd like to take it and use it. So if you want to engage personally in Holy Week, I would suggest to you that Holy Week 101, come to all the services. So check. You've, I think everybody here tonight was here this morning. I can't look around and make sure of that, but okay, you're doing good so far. Check. You're well on your way to Holy Week 101. Holy Week 201, that would be use the devotional guide. Walk your way through each day. Use the devotional guide and come to all the services. Holy Week 301, now, now anybody that comes on Sunday night is a candidate for 301, okay? Holy Week 301 is go through the actual uh, verses. Now, you don't have to do every single one of them. I, do, I focus on different ones different year, but actually uh, pull that off the uh, internet uh, on our website, walk your way through that and familiarize yourself with that and study that uh, throughout the week and use the devotional guide and come to all the services. Holy Week 401, fly to Israel. Okay, so 301 is much cheaper, all right? So I would encourage you to, uh, to embrace that and to be able to uh, see what the Lord has to, uh, to teach you uh, from that. Uh, the desire would be to be intentional about Holy Week, and this would be different for every single one of us in this room. What is it that the Lord has to say to you this week? Uh, uh, we, should have a, we should have a yearning we should have a deep desire to hear from the Lord. Uh, certainly, we want to grow in our understanding historically. Absolutely. That would be beneficial. Uh, I, I would absolutely agree with that. But what we really want to do is hear from the Lord. What is it that the Lord wants to tell us? And it may not be a corporate statement. That could be individual statements to each and every one of us that He wants to reveal much the way He wanted to reveal Himself uh, to the uh, disciples and to, to be able to, uh, for them to hear him, to know and to understand all that he was trying to teach them. As a matter of fact, tonight, this will be a little bit different format. This is, I used to, to love it when Harry would say on a Sunday night, now tonight, I'm going to treat this more like a Bible study. I'm going to treat it more like a discipleship group, and we're going to do it a little bit different. I always loved that. I felt like he was dumbing it down for me, and then I would go to him and say, now what's below that? Give me that too. You know, let's go eat lunch, and I want to get that one too. So tonight, uh, we're going to look at, for the first part of this, we're going to look at uh, what Jesus did from the Gospel of Mark, what he did to prepare the disciples for Holy Week. So if you want to figure out how to prepare yourself for Holy Week, what did Jesus do with the disciples to prepare them for Holy Week? Then we want some time of uh, just a season of prayer for you to, to uh, speak uh, with your Savior and to ask Him to guide and direct you during this time. And then we're just going to look at one passage of Scripture from John uh, chapter 11. If you flip in your Bible, and I would encourage you, it may be easier to do it in a physical Bible than your electronic, but some of you are really, really blessed electronically, but go to Mark 11, Mark chapter 11. We're not going to read uh, Mark 11 because we're going to use three different passages here, but when you get to Mark 11, I just want to note for you that Mark 11 is Palm Sunday, okay? So if you get to Mark 11, you're going to look, that's the triumphant entry Okay, so that's today, that's Palm Sunday, that's what Dr. Doriani uh, preached on this morning. So what did Jesus do prior to that? Well, if you were to back up to Mark uh, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10, you find three events. These are similar events, okay? There's one in chapter 8, there's one in chapter 9, there's one in chapter 10, and we're going to look at them. The first one takes place in Caesarea Philippi. The second one takes place in the region, the Galilean region in Galilee. And the third one takes place on the way to Jerusalem. So for those of you that can picture a map in your head, then do this with me. For those of you that can't, hum Jesus loves me to yourself, okay? But if you can picture a map of Israel in your head over to your right side of the map, all the way up to the uh, uh, top right corner, that would be Caesarea Philippi. You're looking at Israel, okay? On the left is the Mediterranean Sea. On the right is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, uh, and all the, the land east of the Jordan River, okay? So at the top right is Caesarea Philippi. You come down and you'll eventually get to Galilee. That's the second event. You keep coming down to about the, Red, the Dead Sea, but not quite the Dead Sea. If you were coming down, you'd turn right, you'd go west, and you go to Jerusalem. 
you go up through Bethany, up and over the Mount of Olives, and to uh, Jerusalem. So these three events take place in Caesarea Philippi, then Galilee, and then on their way uh, to Jerusalem. So uh, flip over a few pages to Mark chapter 8. We're going to look at starting in verse 31, okay? This is Jesus talking to the disciples in Caesarea Philippi. Um, uh, Peter has just declared that Jesus is the Christ. You remember uh, that taking uh, place. And then in verse 31, he says, and he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with the disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, he let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Okay, that's the event at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus teaches them plainly what is to happen. You see Peter's response to that and then Jesus' response to Peter. Now flip over maybe a page to Mark 9. Uh, drop down to verse 30. Now, this takes place in Galilee. So you're coming south and you're heading to Jerusalem, okay? This is Jesus' last descent from that region, Caesarea Philippi, through Galilee to Jerusalem where he will be crucified. In Mark uh, chapter 9, verse 30, they went on from there and passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they, came to, and they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the 12. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Now drop down to Mark chapter 10. So we've got Caesarea Philippi, Galilee, and then Mark chapter 10 down to verse 32. Now they are literally on the road and they're going up to uh, Jerusalem. So they would have turned west to go up to Jerusalem. It says, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. And taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who have been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they, became, uh, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him. He said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, three stories, all right? Three different events. He's preparing the disciples to go into Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen, and he just told them what was going to happen, and he just told them what was going to happen plainly. 
Mark says. He said it in a very simple, in a very plain, in a very uh, direct uh, way. What's common in all three of the stories is his prophecy about what's going to take place uh, with him. He was teaching them that the, man of, the Son of Man would suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and three days rise again. He said that in Caesarea Philippi. He says the exact same thing uh, in Galilee, in Capernaum. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. When they get almost on their way to Jerusalem, he says to them yet one more time, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Now here's my problem. How on earth did they miss that? How, how do you, I don't get it. I really don't. I, I mean, there had to be some, please tell me, Peter at least objected some, well, we find out that he objects, but they don't digest this. What was going on that kept them from understanding plain talk? Listen, this is not a parable. He didn't say it's like a bird flying through the air who is searching for just the right twig. And you're going, what's the bird? What's the twig? Is there sin? I don't understand what that means. The bird will fly yet again. There was no confusion here. This was direct and this was plain talk. So how could they possibly not have grasped what he said? How could they forget what he said? They missed its meaning completely they forgot completely what it was that uh, he said. And this is not a minor statement. It's not like this is some secondary or tertiary uh, aspect. This is a pretty significant deal uh, that he is uh, trying to uh, explain to them. What was it that caused them not to hear it? Well, I'm gonna put an asterisk. I think there's two things that we need to acknowledge and just put an asterisk there. One, the sovereignty of God, okay? The sovereignty of God was it was not their time to hear it. Okay, so that's one, is just the sovereignty of God. Secondly, the things of the Spirit are spiritually appraised. Always remember that what seems like simple statements, what seems like plain declarative statements that any smart person should be able to conclude, they're only appraised or they're only understood by the Spirit, no matter how simple they are. I have on numerous occasions, one could argue most occasions, shared the gospel with people smarter than me. And I'm just here to tell you the gospel is not a complicated message. I don't understand why they don't understand it. It, it, make, it. it just makes all the sense in the world to me. I don't understand why they don't get it. Why, why do they not see and hear the most common thing? It's not, it doesn't take brain surgery to figure out the gospel, and yet it's not intellectually digested. It's spiritually appraised. So I want to make sure we acknowledge those two things are at work here. But there's something else that's going on here that I think we, we need to take uh, note of. I think there's a lesson uh, here that we can learn uh, from them because there's something else that's common in all three of these different uh, events that, that unfold. In Caesarea Philippi, uh, Peter's response is to rebuke Jesus. I, that's hard for me. I mean, it's Peter, okay, so I get it. But still, that's, that's a little strong, okay? For Peter rebuke. So Jesus says, I'm going to die. They're going to arrest me. They're going to kill me. And the third day, I'm going to rise again. He completely misses the rise again part and says, absolutely not. You see, what Jesus said didn't fit Peter's um, uh, plan. That, Peter had a different idea. Peter had a better way. Uh, he, he thought, no, there's a better way for this to work out, and it's not going to be that you get arrested and that you uh, uh, die, and, and certainly not that uh, you rise from the grave. He had a different agenda, and what Jesus said didn't fit uh, his agenda. He was focused on his own uh, agenda. In Galilee, when he says to the disciples uh, and communicates to them that same thing, that he's going to die, uh, be arrested, he's going to die, and he's going to be uh, rise again, uh, Mark tells us they kept silent because on the way, while they were walking from Caesarea Philippi to Galilee, on the way, they were actually in another conversation that captured their attention more than Jesus saying that he was going to be arrested, be killed, and rise from the grave. And that conversation was, which of them was going to be the greatest? 
You see, they were, they were focused on something other than what Jesus was talking about, and that focus distracted them and kept them from even digesting. They did, it says, Mark says, in Mark it says, they didn't even want to ask questions about what Jesus said because they were embarrassed about the conversation they were actually having along the way. Let me make sure we understand this. Jesus looks at them and says, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to die, and I'm gonna rise again from the grave. They went, okay, who do you think is going to be the greatest? I think it's going to be Peter. No, I think it's going to be John. No, it should be me. I mean, of all the people, I've given up the most. It it should absolutely be me. That's the debate that they were having among themselves. And then the third one on the way to uh, Jerusalem, Jesus no more gets it out of his mouth that he's going to die and rise again from the dead. And the sons of Zebedee come up and go, hey, Jesus, do whatever we ask of you. It's almost like they go, yeah, 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 but do whatever we ask of you, allow us to sit one on the right hand and one on the left hand. We find out that uh, in another uh, gospel that their mother was involved. And then it says that the disciples, they don't look at them and go, hey guys, y'all quit. Jesus, what did you just say was about to happen when we get to Jerusalem? They don't do that. Instead, they get in an argument with the disciples again. Now I wonder why they got in an argument with the two disciples that want to sit at the right hand and the left hand. I got an idea. They want to sit in the right hand or the left hand, or they think somebody's about to get something that they don't get. So either way, their attention is focused upon themselves. Learning lesson. We can get so caught up in being focused on something other than Jesus that we miss the most simple, plain, direct communication that he could give to us. And it's not just that's what happened back then, that can be happening to us right now. That can happen to us even this Holy Week. We could go through this whole Holy Week and we could have our devotional guide and we may even wanna do the 301 uh, plan and yet we're so consumed by ourselves, we're so consumed by what Jesus says, setting our mind on the things of man that we miss the plain talk that he has prepared for them. His response to each of these three situations, Jesus' response is very telling. He says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's bad. Okay, so however you interpret that, that's not a good thing. If you respond to Jesus and he says, get behind me, Satan, he's not complimenting uh, Peter. He's not, he's not saying good for your initiative. Literally, th- what you're saying is the antithesis of what my will is. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. That's a summary statement right there for all three of these answers. You are not setting your mind on the things of God. You have your mind set on the things of man. As a matter of fact, and clearly he then begins to challenge them that Peter, if you or anyone else wants to come after me, the very first thing you need to do, deny yourself. I surrender all. Deny yourself. And you need to take up your cross and you need to follow me. Not focus on yourself, not always consumed by how does this impact me, whatever, the world's not working out the way that I want it to, but, but focused upon Christ and putting Christ first. Uh, in the second example in Galilee, he t- declares to them they need to put others before themselves. So he says to them, uh, he sat down and called the 12. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. So he doesn't go back and repeat what he said. You didn't hear me. I told you I was going to be arrested, crucified, uh, uh, killed, and rise again. He just says, there's something in your life that needs to get fixed. You've got your focus on the wrong thing. You've got it on yourself It should be on Christ first, and it should be on others uh, second. On the way to Jerusalem, same thing unfolds. His response uh, to uh, the disciples when they were arguing over James and John, uh, James and John want that uh, favored seat. Uh, He says, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise uh, authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life uh, as a ransom uh, for many. It's interesting. Uh, In all of this, his whole point that he's trying to make to them is, you can't hear me because you're focused on yourself. 
You can't hear me because you're focused on the things of man. You're focused on the things of the world. You're not focused on the things of God. Isn't it great that we don't have that problem? I do. I get focused on the things of man. I get focused on the things of world. You know, what's, what, what, what's amazing to me is, and, or what's discouraging, I would say, is that they didn't know it. See, they didn't realize that they missed anything. They go strolling into Jerusalem just as happy as a lark. They don't understand. They've missed everything that's happening, even to the degree that even when it unfolds, they respond poorly at every turn. At every turn, they respond poorly, and yet Jesus had tried to prepare them. He had told them, he had communicated it plainly, and yet they're not ready. And they threw their arms up and they said, what's happening now, God? Why are you doing this? Jesus, why are you letting this happen? And they didn't understand because they didn't remember, because they didn't listen, because they only focused on themselves So they weren't listening to what the Savior was saying. We do not want to find ourselves in that position. So that's why we do as we enter into Holy Week, let's enter in acknowledging we could walk the very same path that the disciples walked. We could literally be in their footprints. That's not the footprints we want to be in. We want to be in the footprints of those that are uh, turning our eyes upon Jesus, that are fixating our eyes upon Jesus, uh, that are denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily, and wanting to hear and to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives, wanting to hear and to understand uh, everything that He would have uh, for us. We don't want to wake up one day after events have unfolded and need to be reminded by the angels the way they did the disciples after the resurrection took place and said, remember what he said to you, that he would rise again uh, from the dead. And then, and only then, did they remember, uh, did they remember his word. So as we prepare to walk through Holy Week, we're gonna begin tonight, not with a life application or life takeaway. Now you take this home and do it. We're gonna do it tonight, okay? So we're gonna go and we're gonna spend some time here in just a minute in a season of prayer giving you the opportunity to literally turn your eyes upon Jesus. I love that hymn. I love the words of that hymn because it's turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and what happens? And the things of earth, remember what Jesus said? You're focused on the things of man, the things of this earth, not on the things of God. And the things of earth grow strangely dim. So I'm a very practical person. Here's the measuring stick as to whether or not my eyes are truly turned on Jesus. I realize the hymn is not Holy Scripture. It's just very helpful to me. My eyes are not truly turned on Jesus until the things of earth grow strangely dim. I'm kidding myself if I think they are, if the things of earth, if the things of man are not growing strangely dim in my life, in my heart, uh, et cetera. And we might all be holding on to something different tonight. By God's grace, you may not be holding on to anything, therefore pray for others in the room who are. But we might all be holding on to something uh, different tonight, but I wanna give you an opportunity just to go before the Lord, just a a brief season uh, of prayer as as, as sung for us, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Ask the Holy Spirit uh, to allow us to know, uh, are we fixated on the things of this earth or does Jesus have our undivided attention? Is he, is he ready? Are we ready to go through and to hear what he has for us to say? Would we ask him to work in and through our time in the scriptures and our time in prayer and our time in services to be able to speak to us? Because we want to know our Savior and we want to know him in a deeper way. Take a few moments and turn your eyes upon Jesus.